The Buddha talks about the stages in learning the Dharma. First you have to find someone you trust. Because the Dharma isn't just words, it's a primarily a quality of the heart. I mean, the essence of the Dharma is awakening. That's a quality of the heart. We have words to point to it, but it's not about words. So you want to look for a person who has that kind of quality. Then, as the Buddha says, you draw near and you listen, you lend ear, you listen carefully. Try to remember the Dharma. Although while you're sitting here and meditating, just let the Dharma come past you. If there's any point that's relevant to what you're doing right now, it'll stick in your mind. You don't want the Dharma talk to get in the way of your concentration. And if you pick up something that strikes you as relevant to what you're doing, there is a process where you have to think it through, trying to figure out what it means, how it fits in with the Dharma that you know already. And as Buddha said, when things fit together, that's when you gain a desire to practice the Dharma. In fact, the fact things are coherent. It's not a proof that they're true, but it certainly is encouraging. You have a willingness. In other words, not only do you want to practice the Dharma, but you're willing to submit yourself to what the training requires. Some of the things are pleasant, some of the things are not so pleasant. And we as individuals have different needs. Some people, as the Buddha said, are going to have a pleasant practice. Other people are going to have an unpleasant practice. The unpleasant practice, of course, is the contemplation of the body. It's something we all have to do, but some of us need it more than others. Think about the various parts of the body. What is it you've got here? And you think of all the issues in the world that concern you, the safety of your body, the nourishment of the body, the fact that you have to create shelter for the body. We've been seeing a number of huts go up recently. Walking meditation path covers. Without those things we would die, or we'd really suffer quite a lot. The body has a lot of needs. But then you look at it, and in and of itself it's not anything that's all that valuable. I was reading one of John Fun's Dharma talks, and he was talking about how these, all these things in the body that you just have to throw away. Things come out of the body, you have to throw them away. There's very little that we keep. A child comes out, okay, you keep that, but even when the child comes out, it's pretty disgusting. I happened to go to a Satani Anamai in Thailand. It's a, it was kind of a health unit, I guess you call it, where they'd have a nurse, and I knew the family of the nurse. I happened to visit right after she'd presided over a birth, and the stench that came out of the room was overwhelming. I kept thinking, gee, when I came out of my mother's womb, I smelled that bad as well. We all smell pretty bad. But everything else that comes out of the body, you just got to throw away. And as for the babies coming out, you have to clean them up. And then after a while, the body grows old and it's going to die. Whether you want it to or not, it doesn't ask permission. And so much of our lives are dependent on this. We have to keep contemplating this again and again because we are so attached to the body. And the issues of the body loom so large in our minds. It requires a certain amount of desire and willingness to submit to this kind of practice, because it's something you have to do again and again and again. And John Mahabur talks about how you can't count the number of times you do it, and sometimes it doesn't seem like it's having any effect, but as you chip, chip, chip away at your attachment to the body, it 
would eventually wear a suit. The, the Buddha's image is the handle of a hammer. You use the hammer every day, every day, every day. And you know that the handle's wearing down a little bit. Especially the hammers in the old days when they were made out of made out of the handles were made out of wood. But you can't measure how much it's worn down in a day, but you know that over time it will wear down. So some practices we have to be willing to submit to. And it has to go against our our desires. Some of us would like to have a pleasant practice, but that's nothing we can determine in advance. You have to gauge your own mind, you have to gauge your own practice to see what you need. And then there's what the Buddha calls comparing. In other words, you compare your state of mind to what he talks about. We're all familiar with the passage in the Galama Sutta where the Buddha says, you know, you sub subject teachings to questions. Does this teaching, when you put it into practice, does it lead to what is blameworthy or does it lead to what's blameless? We notice that the Buddha encourages us again and again to ask questions about the teaching so we can understand exactly what it's aiming at and see where it's going. This connects with the word that's often paired with dhamma in Pali, atta, A-T-T-H-A, -T -T -A, which means meaning, but it also means purpose. It also means benefit. What's the benefit of this teaching? What, when you put into practice, will give you good results? What will give you results that you really don't want? That's how you test the teachings. That's how you question the teachings. But at the same time, you have to let the teachings question you. Where is your state of mind right now? How do you measure up against the Buddha's description, say, of right concentration, right mindfulness, right effort? That's what the comparing means there. And you should compare it, and you see that you're lacking here and you're lacking there. And you don't take that as a reason to get depressed or to get discouraged. You just say, this is what needs to be done. Because after all, this is the way to find true happiness. And although we tend to dither around quite a lot on the matter of true happiness, there comes a point where you realize, okay, there's nothing else that's really worth going for. And all the other things in the world, when you pursue them, you can put a lot of energy into it, and the results are not worth the effort that went into it. But this is something that really is worth the effort. It's just that it may take a lot more effort than you're prepared in the beginning. But the whole point of the practice is to make you stronger so that you are capable of doing this. Okay, once you've compared yourself, okay, you get more and more motivated to actually do the practice. And that's when, the Buddha's, as the Buddha says, you learn to touch the Dharma with the body. In other words, where you've got your experience of the body right here, right now, that's where you're going to experience the deathless. It's not a bodily thing, but in, in terms of the centeredness of your awareness. It's nothing out there that you have to go and look and see someplace else. You look inside. And you find that you touch this other dimension here inside. So when the practice isn't going well, ask yourself, which of these stages are you missing? That stage of comparing is important. That's where you ask questions. In the beginning you ask questions about the teaching to learn what it means, but here's where you ask questions about yourself. What am I doing? How does it measure up against? The standards that I've learned, and how do I apply those standards to my particular case? These are questions that are worth asking. How can I bring my practice into line? And if the desire is strong enough and your willingness is strong enough, you'll find a way. And 
And John Fuang talked a lot about using your ingenuity. And those, you get general instructions, but this is not a factory where we just put everything into the factory and it's all going to come out as hot dogs, regardless of what you put into the mixture. It's not just a mechanical process. It's a process of doing and gauging your resu the results, and then doing again and gauging the results again. And the questions that the Buddha told the Kalamas to ask, what, what I put into practice is actually going to give rise to results that are skillful, results that are blame blameless. You start with questions, and then you move into focusing on your breath, or what kind of way of relating to the breath is going to be helpful. How do you relate to the breath in a way that allows the mind to settle down? How do you perceive the breath? In other words, what are the images you hold in mind about what's happening when you breathe? What kind of breathing feels good? What kind of breathing is easy for the mind to stay with? These are questions you have to ask. Nobody else can answer them for you. That's in asking these questions and finding answers. That's how you learn to develop your discernment. Again, discernment is an automatic process. Just say everything is in constant stressful, not self, and just get to the point where you say, oh, yes, 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 I agree. Well, that's not what the Buddha is asking you to do. He's asking you to apply those ideas to whatever comes up. See, is this worth holding on to? Some things are in constant that are worth holding on to, at least for the purpose of the path. Other things are not. The Buddha was like a doctor in that his course of treatment for the disease of suffering is very much like a doctor's approach. You try to comprehend the disease, comprehend the symptoms, so that you can find the cause. Once you find the cause, you abandon it. You develop the path. That's like taking your medicine so that you can achieve true health. Well, that path is like a doctor's path. Some things that a doctor recommends are things that even after the disease has gone away, you're going to have to continue doing. In other words, some of the things we develop on the path are things that will provide a comfortable abiding, even after the path has reached its goal. Things like virtue and mindfulness, concentration, right view. Then there are other things that you use for the purpose of the path, certain attachments, certain desires, even craving and conceit. There's a role for those things in the path. A certain sense of self that's competent. That's also something you want to maintain, a sense of self that's heedful. They can say no to certain desires because you know that they'll give bad results down the line. Let's say yes to others. They will give good results. These are qualities of a healthy self. These are things that you do have to encourage. And so it requires a certain amount of discernment to figure out what kind of selfing is helpful now and what kind is not. Seeing the, your sense of self as an activity helps a lot, because then you can say, well, this is just like any kind of karma. What Certain things are good to do all the time, other things are not good to do at any time. Other things are good sometimes and not at other times. Then your sense of self is like that. Certain kinds of self are things you want to get rid of as quickly as you can. Others you want to encourage, because they'll help you along the path. Now, none of this can be programmed into kind of a franchise meditation. Each person has to develop his or her own discernment as you answer these questions. Ask them first, and then answer them. And realize there are very few pat answers. I mean, some things that are categorically true. Skillful behavior, thought, word, and deed, is something to be developed all the time. Unskillful behavior is just something to be abandoned all the time. 
But then it gets down to the details, and that's where you have to develop your discernment. You ask questions, you learn how to ask the right questions, and then test the answers. So it is a process of questioning, knowing what kinds of questions to ask, but answers will really be satisfactory. If you don't question, the path just doesn't move, it doesn't develop. So try to bring a curious attitude to the path. Here the Buddha is saying that the end of suffering is possible. Something goes beyond our ordinary ken. And if you find the possibility intriguing, well, he's got a course of practice for you to, to follow. If you look at it, it makes sense. Okay. Try to develop that desire and that willingness to do what needs to be done, because no one else can do it for you. And if you don't do it now, when will you do it? We've got the opportunity now. The world's relatively stable, but who knows how much longer that's going to last. Try to be heedful and curious with every in and out breath. 